Nowadays, if you're looking to buy a new phone on a tight budget, you're almost definitely going to end up with an Android device. Android phones cover all price points, from £100 to £1,000, and even above. But things didn't used to be this way. Android was too heavy of an operating system for the cheap processors and the low amount of RAM most low-end phones featured back in the early 2010s. But unlike nowadays, manufacturers had their own operating systems to choose from. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the history of the Samsung Star line of phones, the history of TouchWiz, and Samsung's final attempts to mimic Android with their proprietary operating system. Up until 2017, Samsung did not have their eggs in one basket, having released phones running on Symbian, Windows Mobile, Bada, Tizen, and even their own proprietary platform that we'll be talking about later today. The problem with having different phones running on different operating systems is that they are completely different in looks and functionality. Brand consistency is everything. If you were to switch from Symbian to Windows Mobile, you would then have to learn how to use a completely different operating system. And if you are switching from a Samsung slider or flip phone to any touchscreen phone offering from Samsung, things like for example the icons looking the same between the last device and the new device would instantly make the new phone feel more familiar, therefore easier to use and easier to learn. With this in mind, let's travel back to February 2008. The HTC Dream, the first ever Android phone, was still 7 months away from release. Samsung had decided to drop the Crow UI, an extremely short-lived UI that was created in 2007 as competition to the iPhone. So in February 2008, Samsung had announced the F480 Toco, a phone running on the brand new TouchWiz UI. The UI was very simple to use, and Samsung brought over the icons from the non-touchscreen phones, which made the UI instantly recognisable as Samsung's, and made the brand new UI feel familiar. The phone ran on Samsung's proprietary platform. However, it did not take long for TouchWiz to make it onto Windows Mobile with the i900 Omnia in June 2008, and onto Symbian with the i8910 Omnia HD. Let's move over to 2013. At this point, Samsung had already given up with Bada, which finished on running the S2 version of TouchWiz. Windows Mobile had ceased existing, and basically no one was using Symbian anymore. But yet, Samsung thought that their own proprietary platform should have one last go. I'm carefully omitting using the word Java OS, and are instead referring to these phones as a platform, because they supposedly run a platform named Samsung Mocha. In a way, it's similar to Java. It's a layer that sits above the RTOS, providing the UI, the media features, etc. It's OS agnostic, provided that it's run on an ARM chip, and it's light in size. This is what Samsung dumb phones ran, hence why no matter the model, the UI was identical, even if the chipset was running a Qualcomm or an Argea chip, both with different OSs or RTOSs. Like I said in the intro, Android was not well suited to ultra-budget devices. Reusing Mocha was a smart way to go, since it was light and could do basic smartphone functions like browse Facebook. The first attempt at this was the Star 2, released two years after the original Star. Its touchless version is based on the Bad OS version, which is interesting. It's not all that different to the original Star. We still have the three page layout on the home screen, with the wallpaper moving per page. The icons now more closely resemble the Galaxy S2 era, though they are not all the same. While the white background with blue accents reminds me more of the Galaxy S5 era, funnily enough. Like on Bad OS and Android, we have a notification bar with internet and volume toggles, and we even get a task manager and a CPU utilization meter. I guess Samsung really did try to make this little guy seem like a proper smartphone. Samsung had even developed their own browser based on WebKit, though in 2024, it cannot open anything other than Google and FrogFind, due to no HTTPS support. Even the camera app, and the way that you unlock the display is reminiscent of the Galaxy S2 on Gingerbread. How cute is that? The phone is impressive in its own right, to be fair. It has an accelerometer for bringing up the QWERTY keyboard with swipe support, the aforementioned browser supports flash content, the phone has Wi-Fi, and we do have very rudimentary multi-touch, which I could only get to work on video once. We do also have theme support, and I've downloaded a theme that has more accurate Galaxy S2 icons and color scheme. And finally, we have Fake Call, a feature on a lot of Samsung phones of that era, that allows you to get out of awkward social situations by pretending someone is calling you. You can even have an audio file play when you pick it up. With India becoming a growing market during the 2010s, Samsung saw an opportunity to use the mock platform, or likely an evolution of it, to create a new line of ultra-cheap smartphones. This series of phones were called Rex, and the phones came in various shapes and sizes, taking direct inspiration with their looks from the Ace and the S3 Mini. In fact, the Rex 80 that I own here is secretly a Star 3 with updated firmware. Even the model name is the same, with an R added at the end to signify Rex. Though there are three different firmware revisions. The original Star 3 featured a heavier use of TouchWiz elements from the Galaxy S2, like the icons being directly ripped from its Android counterpart. The Rex 80 firmware adds a new way to input widgets, but otherwise the UI is identical. And here is my Samsung Rex 70 from March 2013, released a year after the Star 3. The first thing that you may have noticed with this phone is just how similar it looks to the S3 Mini, with the polycarbonate back wrapped around the plastic chrome trim. 
versus the Star 3 slash Rex 80 looking like a tiny Galaxy S1 or a Galaxy Ace. The similarities to the S3 don't stop here, as we are up to touch with Nature UX here, with the annoying plop sounds every time you touch the screen, the updated notification panel, and the apps that look far more closer to the way they looked on Android than ever before. Frankly, if you show this phone to someone, I don't think they'd even realise that this is an Android. This is also helped by the aforementioned updated widgets, which look more like they do on Android than ever before. It feels like this version of Samsung's system was dumbed down by quite a fair bit. There's no accelerometer, no accelerated graphics in the UI, no quick reply in the notification bar, and no threads in text messages. But we do have Opera Mini that does actually have HTTPS support, allowing for rendering modern websites, albeit in a broken 12-year-old out-of-date form. Samsung had partnered with Gameloft to bring a lot of unlocked pre-installed games. A lot of the games are tycoon-based, which I'm personally not a fan of, but the other games are pretty decent. Block Breaker 3 has to be my favourite. It's a breakout type game, but the blocks are arranged more similar to Peggle. And the soundtrack is just awesome. The game was at one point available on iOS and Android, which had the same soundtrack, but not in MIDI form. Asphalt 6 is here too, featuring 3D graphics with the lowest render resolution ever. I'd be impressed that this phone can even play 3D games, but Gameloft released 3D Asphalt games for higher-end feature phones for a very long time. But the game is fun and very playable, and in fact most of them are. In terms of specifications, the Rex 70 features 10 megabytes of internal storage and a 2 megapixel camera, while the Rex 80 features a whopping 20 megabytes of internal storage and a 3.1 megapixel camera. Both phones have bad viewing angles, don't get very bright, and have quiet headphone jack outputs. From my understanding, all three phones come with an ARM11 chipset. These are the internal specifications for the Star 3 and Rex 80, and these are the ones for the Rex 70. I can confirm that the Star 3 and Rex 80 are the same device by flashing the firmware from the Star 3 onto the Rex 80 with no problem, though I now have a dual SIM firmware without boot loops when a SIM is inserted, and I cannot find any single SIM firmware. Now I wanted to make sure that I'm correct about Mocha, as Wikipedia had no sources. I can confirm that the internal files of the Toco Lite slash Star 1 are identical to that of Samsung dumb phones. You can even see the same mosaic and picture effects that you get on those. The Star 2 also runs Mocha, but the platform is more advanced with many of the system components being flash files, like the home screen, lock screen, theme preview, calculator, timer, alarm, help app, and the image editor. The Star 3 slash Rex 80 has a completely different file structure. Thankfully, a lot of the user components are actually fat disks, and we do have the signature Samsung files, like a TFS file and WGT for widgets, so I think it's Mocha too? During the Rex's very short lifespan, Samsung went ahead and tweaked the OS to work on non-touchscreen phones, well, more like a single phone, they also updated the OS with the correct icons to match the Galaxy S3's Nature UX. And to my knowledge, this is the last time this OS was used. Overall, all of these phones did not need to exist, but I'm so glad that they did, because it signifies an important part of Samsung's mobile history, back when Android wasn't on literally everything. These phones are really special to me, because in my eyes they are essentially toggle lights, with the latest version of TouchWiz at the time, something I never expect to see in my life. Imagine if Samsung today was to release a Tizen phone with one UI, I'd buy one purely because it's so different and yet so familiar. Anyway, that's enough of my rambles. Thank you for watching, and I hope to revisit some of Samsung's other non-Android endeavors soon, like Tizen or by the OS. But for now, I hope to see you for the next video.